welcome to Overflow. How are we feeling tonight? Oh, we are really into it. All right, well, just to start off, um, I'm going to give a little shout out to one of my favorite groups of people here at Overflow. OCO, are you guys here tonight? Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick shout out to OCO and just all that they're doing. So for those of you who don't know, OCO is our Overflow Campus organization at UNCW. So every Monday night they meet so they can go. There they are. Mm -hmm. Those are our fearless leaders right there. But every Monday night they meet so that they can be an outreach of Overflow on campus. So what they do is they go and they spread the word. They chalk on campus. They start conversations. Maybe some of you guys are here because of those conversations. That's awesome. That's the point. That's what we want. Um, I know for me, um, I would walk around when I was a student at UNCW and I'd see Overflow's chalk and I was like, fine, I guess I got to check out this Overflow place. And so that was part of what brought me here too. And then I have loved it ever since. So um, OCO, thank you guys for what you do. Seriously, it makes a big difference for Overflow and then also just in the lives of a lot of people when they get to come here and encounter Jesus. Um, so if you guys are interested in joining OCO sometime, they're going to be at the Connect Center um, out back, or out front after this. Um, so go out and talk to them. They will get you all connected. Cool? All right, second thing that I want to talk about is um, tonight's going to look a little bit different. And we're going to lean in and be excited about it looking different. It's not going to be anything too crazy, but guys, tonight is going to look different. And it's because we're going to lean into a conversation that needs to happen here at church. Um, we're going to talk about um, sexual trauma, and we're going to talk about healing and the hope in the midst of that. And so for those of you, maybe your story hasn't been impacted by sexual trauma, but because the reality is that lots of people in this room have. And so we know that as an Overflow staff, we've had conversations, we've built relationships, we know that those stories are in the room. So what we want to do is lean in and say that you're seen and you're known, you matter and you're here, okay? So kind of, as I've just been praying about tonight and been like, Lord, give me something about tonight. Um, the big thing that God keeps reminding me of is His presence. And His presence is something that's here, it's near, but it's also there, it's far, but it's also everything in between that. God is present at all times and all things. And so if we get to be an embodiment of that, it means that we get to be present with other people. And we get to be present with people in the midst of their suffering. And we are present even when it's uncomfortable. And so what I want more than anything for tonight is just to be a night that we're present. We're present in a conversation that sometimes isn't present here in the church, but we're leaning in to say yes to it. All right, so this whole night is going to be really cool. Clay is going to um, interview a lady named Crystal, and he will give you a full rundown on her. Um, but she ha just has a lot of wisdom and a lot of things to share and has a big heart for people who this is part of their story. And we just want you to know there's hope. That's the big thing is we just want you to walk away from tonight knowing that there is hope because we serve a God who is hope, right? And so when we are talking about God, um, a God who is good, a God whose heart is for healing, a God who is love, who is faithful, and who sees you right where you are, and that's the God that we get to worship tonight. That's the God who's worthy of our worship, and so we are going to band together as one body, and we're going to be part of that. So even if you are, like I said, haven't been impacted, someone here has, so declare these truths about God for them. Like, let's declare it for each other. Let's be the body of Christ for each other together tonight as we enter into this conversation. Does that sound good to you guys? Okay, cool. Well, we are going to start with worship, so if you guys want to stand up, and we are going to worship together.
I will say no other. 
thinking about this song we're about to sing, It's No Longer Slaves. Um, I've been thinking about this song for a couple weeks now because we sang it at church. Um, and if you guys don't mind me sharing a little bit about what I've been going through. Um, for about two months now, it feels like, um, I've just been sick and haven't been able to sing. And when you're sick, you just don't feel yourself. And you're not able to give your 100%. And for me, a lot of negative thoughts just kept popping in my head and that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't doing enough. I just felt very worthless. And, you know, I'm constantly reminded by amazing friends and God that that's not true. But these happen. And for me, that's what I've been going through. And kind of just felt like this mountain that I was walking up, just trekking up, that was trying to overcome sickness and these thoughts. And God has already overcome. He's already taken care of everything. And he reminds us of our identity and who we are. And it's not what we do. But we are children, we are sons and daughters of God. And I don't know what your story might be, what your mountain might feel like, if it's fear, if it's anxiety, if it's doubt, if it's sickness, if it's depression, whatever it may be. I really encourage you guys to sing this song because of course it goes, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And we sing that over and over again. And that's huge to declare that boldly, but I would really strongly encourage you guys to sing out whatever it is over your own life that you're going through. Whether you're saying, I am no longer a slave to anxiety. Just be bold and step out and declare that because God has taken it on him. He's overcome. He promises us love and that we're wrapped up in his arms. So let's sing this together and let's declare truth over our lives. We are no longer slave to fear, whatever it might be, but we are wrapped up in his arms. So let's sing this together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround
whatever it is. I am no longer a slave to sickness. I am no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to doubt. I'm no longer a slave to insecurities. Let's all sing that together. Let's, let's declare whatever it is and leave it here and know that we are surrounded by the Father. So let's sing this together. Promises are true. We are sons and daughters of God. Lord, thank you for all that you are continuing to do in and through our lives. Jesus, you are great. Your goodness reigns. God, we love you. We thank you today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What's up, Overflow? How we doing? Man, if you've already experienced freedom tonight, can we just thank the band for leading us in that kind of worship tonight? So good, so good. So um, you, you guys know this, we're in the final week of our series, First Comes Love. And last week we talked about friendship. Y'all remember this? And we actually, I actually used this table to talk about the importance <laughs> of getting with our friends around a table, spending time together and growing in depth together. Uh, getting around a table to spend time together and have real conversations together. And tonight, um, that's kind of what we get to do. I get to sit across the table from a friend of mine and have a real conversation, a conversation that I think is needed and a conversation that I think a lot of you in the room tonight will find hope and you'll find your first steps in healing through this conversation tonight. And so um, I'm excited for this. I have a lot of hope for this, and I hope that you can feel that and that you can feel safe in this place tonight to enter into this conversation. Before we get too far, I do want to introduce you to my friend, so she's not just sitting here. Um, Overflow, this is my friend Crystal Sutherland. Can we welcome Crystal yeah. to Overflow? <laughs> um, Crystal, with that, would you just kind of tell Overflow a little bit about yourself, who you are? Okay. Well, you know, coming off of that song, I just have to clarify, I am a child of God. Praise yeah, Jesus. amen. Um, and I'm glad to meet all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so my name, of course, is Crystal Sutherland, and um, I am a wife of 26 years this year, yeah. and a mother of three, and a grandmother, believe it or not. Clay actually awesome. made a comment. He was like, had to like look at that again when he saw my notes. She's a grandmother, y'all. <laughs> anyway. That made me feel really good. So yeah, I'm a grandmother, a grandmother of two, mother of three. And then I am also a writer and um, I've authored a book and I founded a ministry called Journey to Heal Ministries mm -hmm. here in Wilmington. And my family and I moved here um, about five years ago from Charlotte for my husband's work. And we moved here with our youngest son, Isaac. 
and uh, we just love it. Love it here. It's awesome. Yeah. Great. So um, tonight, I've asked Crystal to join us um, because as we close off this series, um, we do want to step into a conversation, a conversation of hope and healing uh, in regards to sexual trauma. And so uh, we want to enter into that conversation with you guys. We want to invite you to kind of participate and listen in um, to what Crystal has to share and what God's showing us and teaching us and revealing to you guys. Um, you know, last, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about um, the power of sex. And we talked about the, the lie of sex that so many of us buy in our culture today, right? This lie that sex is something that you can use to get what you want or what you think you need or what you feel like God is withholding from you, right? And when we, when we use sex in that way, we actually take sex out of God's perfect design for it and we make it a tool for our disposal, for, to serve us, right? And when we use sex as a tool, inevitably um, we hurt people. Yeah. Um, and on the other end of that lie that sex can be used to get what I need, what I want, can be used to get worth or value or acceptance or control or validation or love or maybe just attention. On the other, other end of that is a person who's been used, a person who maybe has been abused. And so we want to step into this conversation because we know in a room this size that um, there are many of you who've experienced sexual trauma. You've experienced sexual abuse or sexual assault. And we know that because the statistics tell us that, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of statistics out there, but the one that we want to share with you tonight is just from the CDC. It's a very common statistic. It's very understood and widely believed. And it's this, that in America alone, one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. One in three women. And y'all, one in four men. This is not just a, a women's thing. This is all of us. Right? And so if you take that statistic and you look at a room like this, we recognize that it's not just numbers. We recognize that that statistic are names and faces. Right? And we want to enter into that and speak um, to you because we know that's true. And we want you to know this, that healing is possible. But healing is a process. Mm. And every process always requires participation. And so tonight, if... If nothing else, we want to engage with you as a college student, as a young adult, as an 18, 25 year old, and help you understand how to take some first steps in that process towards healing. So um, tonight, if you're in the room and you're already squirming because this is kind of feeling tough for you, I hope that you have a friend. We talked about that last week. I hope you have a friend you can kind of just lock arms with. Um, but we want you to know that if sexual trauma is a part of your story, that this is a safe place, okay? The, the church is a safe place for you to come into. Not only that, we've been praying over this place, that this would be a safe place for you tonight. Um, but at, at any point tonight, as we're talking, as you're hearing Crystal share from her story and experience and from what she does and gets to work with people on, if at any point you feel pushed a little bit too much and you just need to get some space, um, we want you to know that you're, you can feel free just to get up walk out, use the bathroom. People use the bathroom every Tuesday, right? So that's not gonna be a weird thing, right? We cool with that? You can <laughs> pop up, you can head out like you're going to the bathroom, you can just get some air, right? Um, tonight, um, Crystal's up here, but man, we have um, other um, adult trauma-informed mentors who are here tonight to serve you, to love you, to talk with you, pray with you. So even as you go out, maybe need some space or some air, use the bathroom. Kaylin's out there. Other of these mentors, they have little um, beautiful name tags on Journey to Heal. Just feel free to know that they're here for you, okay? So tonight, safe place, right? And, and one of the things that I love to do, safe place, let's just take a breath together, right? Because a lot of us had stopped breathing, me included probably, <laughs> and like, okay, this is going to be good. This is going to be purposed. And we believe that God has something he wants to say to us tonight. So um, the reason specifically I asked Crystal for you to be here, obviously you've already shared a little bit, but like, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways, this is kind of your, your life work. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about your ministry, about the organization um, that you lead? Yes. So the short answer, really what I do and what I'm passionate about is helping survivors heal from past sexual trauma by leading them to hope and healing in Christ. And that's really at the heart of Journey to Heal Ministries. In fact, that is our mission. 
And we do that in some very key ways. We're very passionate about it. And because the reason we're passionate about it is like myself, all of the people who serve at Journey to Heal Ministries, whether on our board or as mentors, they are also survivors of sexual abuse. And we have men and women um, on our team and some of whom are here tonight to serve you. And we're passionate about it because we all know the damaging effects, the long-term damaging effects of sexual trauma um, whether it was a one-time event or happened over you know, several months or several years of, of someone's life. And we know how that impact can also be generational. Yeah, that's right. And so we're very passionate about providing um, trauma-informed support groups and um, one-to-one mentoring. We do one-to-one mentoring not only uh, for individuals but also for couples because obviously marriages are deeply impacted and wounded uh, by whether it's one uh, one spouse who is a survivor or both. And we also uh, do and and focus a lot on providing awareness and education events for the public to help foster understanding about this issue. And so we really jump on every opportunity, like like tonight when Clay um, opened this opportunity for us to share. And then one of the big things we do is provide life-giving community for survivors because our goal is that they not only survive their past, but learn how to thrive into whom they're created to be, yeah. So good. So um, before we go any further, um, I would say that, um, Crystal, you, organization you lead, Journey to Heal, um, by no means are we trying to do an infomercial tonight. No, no right? infomercial. Um, mm-hmm. That's not Crystal's heart. That wasn't my mm-hmm. heart in inviting her. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I thought about it, and as I even wanted her to talk specifically about this organization, it's because our mission is to help you as college students, you as 18, 25-year-olds, walk yeah. with God. Yeah. Right? And the reality is um, the different places that you are in life, some of those places we are very well equipped as overflow staff within our organization, within community groups. We are, we're positioned to help you. Like, yeah, come on, we can talk through that. We can walk through that. Um, but when it comes to um, sexual trauma, um, we recognize that what Crystal and her, um, her people are doing is exactly what you would need. And so it's like, we just wanna, hey, how can we like leverage that and like point you guys into a direction that is like ready for you? Like they don't have to go and write the book. It's already been written. Um, and so not an infomercial, but it's like walking with God is practical, right? It's practical. And this might be a practical step for you. Um, one of the things, Crystal, that um, I, I love, and I hope that you guys are like into this now too, is I love to define things. Yes. I love to define words. I think definition brings people on the same page. And so um, I want to kind of offer a definition for what we're talking about. Yes. Specifically, when we're talking about sexual abuse. What is the definition for that? And you shared this with me, and this comes from the American Psychological Association. And this is a very, very helpful definition. So I wanna kind of walk us through that. So it'll be on the screen. This is the definition. It says that sexual abuse is any unwanted sexual activity. Let me read that again. Sexual abuse is any unwanted sexual activity with perpetrators using force, making threats, or taking advantage of victims not able to give consent any unwanted. It goes on to say this, it says that most victims and perpetrators know each other, which I find is so interesting because that's not what we typically think. We think the perpetrator is this random person, stranger, but typically it's, we're finding it's relational. There's already a relationship there. And it says that the immediate reactions to sexual abuse include shock, fear, or disbelief. And then long-term symptoms include anxiety, fear, or post-traumatic stress disorder. So Crystal, as I read that definition and I think about that for our students and stories I know and people I know and just the statistics that tell us that that's here, I think a lot of them would walk in the room tonight like knowing Mm -hmm. that sexual trauma is a part of their story. But I also think that there are some students who maybe walked in tonight and um, they, um, they didn't quite know that or they didn't remember or recognize that they are a victim of sexual abuse until I just read that definition. Yeah. Any unwanted sexual activity. Yeah. Um, or, or maybe they, they walked in the room tonight and they've had these um, symptoms. They, they felt the shock, they felt the fear, they felt the disbelief, um, anxiety. They, they feel these um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder in relation to a sexual incident, but they've never named it sexual abuse. And then, of course, there are students in the room who they have never been touched by sexual trauma, and that's 
great, but I wonder if you could just take a couple minutes to speak to the student in the room who is here and they're like, sexual trauma is a part of my story, whether I knew it or whether I'm learning it or whether I'm remembering it right now. Like, what would you say, what would you say to that student? Yes, I would be honored to answer, yeah. answer that um, question. Listen, if you're here and, and you already know that's a part of your story or maybe just by coming here because you saw what Overflow is gonna be about tonight and, you, and you're like, you know, I think that might be a part of my story. I wanna go find out more about that. Wherever you're at in that, in that part or that process of yeah. acknowledging your story, I want you to know, listen, the first and foremost, most important thing you need to know and I wanna say to you, and I'm also gonna say on behalf of those um, of us here, all of us here at Journey to Heal Ministries here tonight, listen, we're sorry. We're sorry that happened to you. I'm very sorry that that happened to you if that's a part of your story. You need to know that it was wrong, and I'm really sorry. And the other thing you need to know is that it is not your fault. It's not your fault. That's huge. And that can be a very hard and difficult thing to accept, especially if you felt like you put yourself in that situation or maybe there's all kinds of things in our society kind of has such a misconception overall what consent means. But listen, non-consensual sex, just like the, the definition that was read there, it, it can be visual. Mm. You could have been shown pornography, you know, as a child. It can be verbal things that are said, off-color jokes or sexual harassment. It can be physical. It's any form of non-consensual sex. And that is a crime. That's sexual assault. It is a crime. And it is not your fault. It is not ever, and I repeat, never the fault of the victim. That's really important. That's, num yeah. that's number one. Number two is you're not alone. Mm -hmm. I would tell you that you are not alone. Just statistically, you can see that you're not. Yep. But it's not only that you're not alone in your story of sexual trauma, you're not alone in how you feel. Mm. Those feelings are not unique mm. to you. Trust me, every, every person who's been through sexual trauma, there are some very specific, very common things that we all go through. So you're not alone in that. And the final most important is there is hope for healing. There is hope for healing. And I'm living proof of that. I sit here and I can tell you mm. there is no amount of hurt that God can't heal. Yeah, so good. Um, we were talking a couple weeks ago and you were kind of, you said something, I'm not even sure how much time you spent on it, but it stood out to me, <laughs> the idea of um, we, can, we can listen, but if we wanna experience healing, we have to receive. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, we're good at like listening to things and hearing a lot of noise, but I think like what you just said, like, you've got to receive that. Yeah. You can't just hear that you're a victim and it's not your fault. You have to receive that. Yeah. You can't just hear that there is hope in Jesus. You gotta re receive that. And if you, even if you don't believe it right now, even if you can't say, I know that to be true, receive it and take it into yes. you. Yes. Um, all right, Crystal, so with that in mind, I would love for you to share part of your story because I think that the reality is um, that sexual trauma, events from our past, for us, it's so real, it's so personal. Yes. And we can talk like theoretically about these things, but you've lived it, you've walked it. So just start to talk <laughs> us through a bit of your story as it relates to like sexual trauma. Yes, okay. So I'm just gonna say, and, and this is not in my notes, but I feel like I do need to say this um, for someone here in this room. Um, listen, it's never easy uh, it's not ever easy. Every time I share my story, and I've shared it many, many times, I've written a book <laughs> on yeah. it, um, and I've already talked to Clay, and we've already had dialogue about my story, but it is, it is always a challenging thing to do because it's personal, yeah. and so for, for you in the room, if this, is, if this is a part of your story, I want you to know, even though I'm sharing bits and pieces and I might, you know, um, uh, I don't know, I might sound like I have it all together or whatever, I don't wanna give you any misconception. Yeah. I'm up here, I think I told Clay I'm as nervous as a turkey um, at Thanksgiving. So. <laughs> it's pretty nervous. It's pretty nervous. <laughs> so the reality is yeah. this is not easy, but God has made it possible for me to do this and to be able to share, and it's my heart to share. Yeah. Um, so 
as I shared earlier, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse in particular, but I also had some incidences um, in early college that, um, uh, an assault that happened in early college. Um, the abuse first started when I was about 10 and it escalated and progressed until I was about 16. And the person who abused me was in, uh, lived in my home. He was my um, mom's third husband. And when it first happened to me, when he first abused me, I, I was just as the, as the definition said, I was in shock and I was in fear. Mm -hmm. And I really froze, I didn't know what to do. And I definitely was afraid to tell my mother. Um, so I didn't tell anyone and I didn't tell my mother. Part of the reason I didn't tell my mother was because, and, I, and she's not a terrible person or a horrible person, but she has a story of her own. She came out of a very abusive family of her own. And so she was a little scary and frightening when I was a child. She could be very abuse, um, physically abusive yeah. and emotionally abusive. So she was not a safe person for me to go to about much of anything, but definitely not about this. And so I kind of hoped that maybe um, this was just a terrible mistake and, and he would never do it again, but unfortunately he did, and he did, and he did. And during that dark time in my life, I, I thought of a lot of things. Um, I've struggled with, obviously, uh, depression and some, and some just profound fear. And I thought about suicide. I have a low pain tolerance, <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> and so the idea of really following through with anything like that was just not gonna happen for me. Um, but, but I did think about that, and I thought about homicide. Uh, I thought about um, running away. Running away was also not really a possibility. We lived in a very small town, and anyone, everyone knew everyone, and they would just pick me up and take me back home. That's what would happen if I ran away. So um, the reality is I, I really felt stuck, but in that darkness, Something awesome happened. I met Jesus. And it actually happened through um, a little friend of mine that lived not too far from me. She, um, she invited me to a youth event and at her church. And we, we didn't really go to church um, as a family. Uh, so I really didn't know a lot about God and didn't know a lot about Jesus. And, but I went with her because it sounded like fun and I had no idea what to expect and so it was all good. And, but I heard the gospel for the first time that night and I immediately made a decision for Christ. And you know, it was interesting because as I started going to Sunday school, learning about him, I, I learned that he loved me unconditionally. Yeah. And that was pretty cool. In fact, one of the first scriptures that I ever um, memorized out of Sunday school was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, mm -hmm. which says, if you don't know what it says, it says, do not uh, lean on your own understanding. Well, it says, trust in God with all yeah. your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And that has actually been more or less a, a scripture or a mantra or whatever you wanna call it. It's been the theme of my life that I have focused on is, is really just trusting him with everything um, and allowing him to lead me. And so in the course of that, in the course of that time, uh, you know, it was... Uh, I think the, probably the biggest challenge was I had this information and I had this relationship with God and I kind of hoped that in that, and I did have hope that it, that, that relationship was going to change yeah. my situation, it was gonna end the abuse. Unfortunately, the abuse continued for another couple of years. And, um, you know, obviously in all of that, a lot of my emotions and, and fears and, and, and um, thoughts of suicide and other things escalated, but... I kind of wanted God to give me this big rescue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of like, well, like what he did for the Israelites in the Old Testament. Yeah. I literally, I remember at one point praying for a swarm of bees <laughs> or like some kind of like catastrophic curse or just Lights. something. I'm, you know, it's, it, you laugh, but it's true. I was yeah. praying for yeah. that. <laughs> Please just come wipe them out. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't happen. Um, but what God did do, and this is what he often does in our lives as we grow in relationship with him is he gave me the courage and the mm. grace to go ahead and tell my mother, mm. regardless of what her response was gonna be. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I was 15 and a half, I told my mom, and unfortunately, she did exactly what I feared most, she essentially blamed me. And she did not uh, report it. Of course, I didn't even know what he was doing was a crime, I didn't know that till much later in my life. Um, she didn't report it, she stayed in the marriage, um, and, but the abuse stopped that day. The abuse stopped, but we continue to be a very dysfunctional family, as you can imagine. And 
And in all of that, I went on a downward spiral. At that point, I became very reckless. Mm -hmm. uh, reckless at school, started just really making horrible grades. Um, I just didn't care anymore. I became reckless with boys, and I actually found myself in a very compromising situation um, with a boy who expressed interest in me. He, we went to high school together, and he lived not far down the road from me. And I was, you know, uh, just before my, or just after my 16th birthday, and, and basically, you know, he, you know, promised he'd be my boyfriend, and that he loved me, thought it was beautiful, and all these things. And I went to his home, and he assaulted me. And that's how my first daughter came about. So here I am, pregnant, and trying to finish up uh, high school. And uh, it was a nightmare, um, as you can imagine. And things escalated in my home. You know, even though the sexual abuse was no more, there was still physical and verbal um, abuse and from my mother, and obviously the awkwardness and the weirdness of being there with my abuser and now being a, a teen mom. So I left. Before my 18th birthday, I moved out, and I really thought at that point, I'm just, I'm just gonna get away from this and everything's gonna be okay. And honestly, Clay, I had no idea how damaged I really was. I had mm -hmm. no idea how much the abuse affected me. Mm -hmm. what, what were some of those effects? Like, we, we read the definitions, some of those short-term, long-term, but for you, like, what was, the, what was the effect of that trauma on you? Yeah, I think the overarching, I think the biggest one was shame, just an mm -hmm. overwhelming sense of shame um, that really influenced me profoundly in how I approached everything. Uh, so how I approached my, you know, uh, early college, how I approached relationships, how friendships, all of it, how I looked at myself. I mean, I literally felt worthless. And, and as I said, you know, in spite of my earlier decision for Christ, I had, um, I, I, it wasn't that I became promiscuous because I kind of want to clarify this because I think there's misconceptions sometimes about what happens with sexual abuse survivors, uh, it, we can it kind of go in two different directions, either become very promiscuous or um, we can uh, completely have an aversion to physical intimacy of any kind. Um, I became promiscuous, but it wasn't because I wanted a sexual relationship. It was because I wanted love and acceptance, mm -hmm. and I kind of looked for that in a lot of mm -hmm. the wrong ways. Yep. And that just added to my shame. That just added, you mm -hmm. know, to my hurt. And... Um, Really, honestly, I think one of the other effects or the way that, that this had profoundly impacted me was because I was making those decisions, um, you know, I, I found myself in another situation in early college with another boy that I had gone to high school with where we had, we had um, kind of had some classes together in early college and, he, and uh, found myself in a compromising situation with him and he, he asserted himself on me and basically assaulted me. And I didn't even think of it as assault because I had invited him in and I was yeah. putting myself in that situation. So it was a long time. It was actually, it was actually honestly when I began to, to, to face my story of abuse, which, which didn't happen until fast forward from college. You know, I'm literally just working as hard as I can to make the best grades, do the, just do the work, and I've got goals, and I've got my daughter, and I'm just living life mm -hmm. as hard as I can to achieve, 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 and I'm yeah. really thinking, as long as I don't see my abuser, as long as, I, as long as I work really hard, you know, and I go to church, and I do all these things, that I'm just gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, fast forward, I'm 38 years old, I'm a stay-home mother of, th of three, um, my marriage is falling apart. I'm literally celibate in my marriage because I'm completely like scared to death of having physical intimacy with my husband because of all the feels and the hard and the weird that I'm feeling inside. I'm angry, I'm struggling with depression, um, anxiety, nightmares, flashbacks, panic attacks. I can't sleep at night, I gotta sleep with a light on. I mean, I really thought I was crazy. I really thought I was crazy. And there, I can tell you there were several points where I kind of felt like, Maybe it'd be better, my family would be better off without me. And so it was at this point that I realized I really needed help. It was just kind of mm -hmm. coming unraveled. Yeah. We talked about shame a couple weeks ago. We said, you know, shame doesn't say that you did bad. Shame says that you are bad, right? And I think what's so interesting as we've talked is like 
the emotions mm. that get wrapped around trauma and abuse yeah. and our past and pain, they, those emotions do things. Like they tell us things. Oh, yeah. And, and we think, well, if we hustle more or we do more, we'll get past it or time. Yeah. But like we've got to enter into those places of our emotions and how we feel and why we feel that way and replace it, those lies, with yes. truth. Yes, with biblical truth. If we're ever gonna mm-hmm. find hope and healing. Mm-hmm. And the biggest, the, probably the biggest thing there you hit was shame. Yes. We, we think we're worthless. You, you said that you felt like you like carried a sign yep. that like I'm worthless. Yep. And I'm sure that resonates with students in the room. Yeah. Um, okay, so to kind of like bring your story to a close, like where and how did you begin to find healing in, for yourself and your story? Yeah. So basically, you know, at this point, you know, I'm coming unraveled and and I need to give context. You know, I was very involved in my church at this point. I'm, you know, like I say, 38, stay home mom, kids, all the things. And I was a homeschool mom, you know, at that point. So I, I. (laughs) Top top mom. Yeah, I was, I was (laughs) high achiever, people pleaser. That's me. And um, so, uh, golly, I was in all kinds of stuff in my church. Um, music ministry, women's ministry, children's ministry, Mm -hmm. ugh, Mm -hmm. wore a lot of hats, and all good stuff, but my pastor's wife, she basically, I think she saw uh, some of my crazy and recognized it, and she um, had, by this point, she was my, the music director too, so she was, she wore a lot of hats where I was involved as well, and so she kind of invited me into um, a mentoring relationship with her, and it was her, really. Um, She did something really profound. Um, She allowed me a safe place to share my story. In fact, she was the first woman that I shared my entire story with, Mm -hmm. And she listened to me, mm-hmm. and she believed me. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things she said to me after, she, after it took several it took several meetings with her for me to unpack my story without blubbering everywhere and crying, and sure. I just being able to get yeah. through it. So when she finally heard the whole thing, she told me it was not my fault, mm. and that was that was big coming from her. I really yeah. I really respected her yeah. and admired her, and um, so that meant a lot to me. And I, and I knew she knew what she was talking about because she shared, part, she shared part of my story. She had a similar story. And so another thing that she did that was really important or really profound is she told me to begin journaling and to mm-hmm. write down my story. So she gave me some application or some steps yeah. that I could do. And she told me to get educated. She told me that I needed to find out what sexual trauma is and how it impacts a person. And so I did the logical thing. This is probably what y'all do too. Um, I went and got a book. Well, I actually went to Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Well, I actually got a caramel macchiato, went to Barnes and Noble <laughs> right. and sat there. Good choice. And, yeah, all the things. And so I went to the Christian living section first and could not find anything, which was kind of disappointing. Yeah. I did find a book uh, by Joyce Meyer called Beauty for Ashes. She basically tells her story and it was really good. And it's packed with scripture and it's, I devoured that book. Um, and then I also found another book. Uh, well, actually, then I kind of waltzed over to the psychology section and, and found mm-hmm. several books, some helpful, some not so much. Mm-hmm. One of the books that I found is Dr. Dan Allender's book called The Wounded Heart. He's a survivor of mm-hmm. sexual abuse. He was abused by his father. And he's also a clinical psychologist and a Christian. And mm-hmm. so he kind of speaks um, to this wound and really helps people um, work through it. Uh, I sat there with my caramel macchiato on the floor of... Barnes and Noble in that aisle and opened up to one of the first chapters in his book and he laid out a definition of sexual trauma. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, I'm 38 years old. Like, I'm a grown woman at this point, right? I mean, I'm way past those years of abuse. I'm sitting there and I just started bawling mm-hmm. yeah. because I read that definition and it was just like, that was the first time any, I, anyone told me yeah. that what my stepfather did to me was a crime. Yeah. Like he could have went to prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it wasn't my fault, like legitimately, because Dan Allender's telling me it's not my fault. And yeah. he should know. Yeah. So it was big. That was big. So that was, a, that was a really big part of my healing was getting educated, was, was being told it wasn't my fault, sharing my story, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, so kind of fast forward through this process, I, cu- I couldn't find what I was really looking for was kind of something um, that was like a guidebook written mm-hmm. by particularly I wanted to hear from a woman because mm-hmm. obviously my abuser was a man and it, I just had a hard time hearing from men in my life at that point. Sure. 
So I wanted to hear from a woman who knew Jesus and who was farther down the road in healing than I was and, and could kind of give me some steps. Couldn't find that book, but it was okay because God surrounded me by some very um, strong Christians and believers and people who love me. And obviously my wonderful husband of 26 years really supported me and, and helped me and listened to me. And so as I, as I began to just kind of uh, really kind of go through um, this process of healing for myself and gleaning from, from friends and different people in my community at church and, and a lot of God's word, um, I really began to heal. And I began, one of the big things that I discovered through that process was that the anger, because I carried mm. a whole lot of anger, yeah. um, that actually manifested in some really ugly ways like perfectionism and controlling behavior and mm. being judgmental of others and very critical of myself and everyone else, and on and on and on, um, and depression. Uh, I figured out where my anger was coming from and it really wasn't my abuser. It, it wasn't the boys that assaulted me, it was my mother. Mm. Is my mother who really essentially, not trying to be critical, but she abandoned and betrayed me. And that betrayal cut really deep and that's what I was mad about. So mm -hmm. God kind of helped me figure out a way to process that through journaling. I journaled yeah. a lot. Um, I talked to her a lot, not in person or on the phone, but like when I was in the shower taking a shower, she wasn't there, but <laughs> I had a lot of words for her. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, and I kind of just worked through all those emotions and all those feelings. And yeah. that was a huge, huge part of my healing was processing yeah. that. And then ultimately I had a chance to have a real conversation with her after I had kind of worked through a lot of the mm -hmm. emotion of it. And God gave me that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it was like a hundred pound weight taken off of my shoulders to yeah. actually be able to confess and verbalize to her how I felt and to do it in a non-emotional, very honest and speak the truth in yeah. love kind of way. And that was profound. Mm. It healed me in a lot of ways. And, and, then, and then just, you know, as I, as I was able to do that, then I was able to kind of get to the place where I could forgive her and forgive my abusers. Mm. And, and even though that didn't really entail or mean that I was gonna necessarily have a relationship with them, it was really just being obedient to what I knew God wanted me to do. And that was very big for me, just on so many levels. And so as I was able to do that, there were other layers that just kind of dropped off, layers of hurt and pain that allowed me to just kind of be new, I guess. And, yeah. and, and, and the Lord was making me new mm -hmm. uh, in so many ways and, uh, and healed healed my sexuality. I won't go into all that, but oh my goodness, um, that, you know, he restored what I, what the enemy tried to destroy yeah. in my marriage, yeah. and, and that was beautiful. And, and so as he did all of this, um, and I reached a certain place of healing, one of the things that just became clear, I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to write down this journey, mm -hmm. this thing, this, this process that he took me through, because literally I felt like I was wandering through the dark most of the mm -hmm. time, and I just didn't want other women or other survivors yep. to do this. So, so I did. Um, I, I eventually penned a book called Journey to Heal, uh, Seven Essential Steps of Recovery for Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. And it really speaks not only to survivors of childhood sexual abuse, but anyone who's been through any kind of sexual trauma, no matter their age. Mm -hmm. and, and that just, that released in 2016, and since then, I have mentored so many women. We've launched Journey to Heal Ministries mm -hmm. in 2018. Just a lot, you know, of beautiful things going on. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, one thing I can say for sure is, God has healed me in ways, Clay, I did not even think possible. It's not just that I don't struggle with depression or anxiety or panic attacks or, I mean, I can sleep with the light off now and I, I don't yeah. have nightmares anymore, none of that. He's healed, you know, like I say, he's healed my sexuality, making me whole in ways I didn't think I could ever be. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just that, like he is, and I know he is continuing to move me forward, but he has given me such a peace and grace mm. and a passion yeah. for helping others as well. And so I know if he can do it for me, he can do it for anyone yeah. else. That's right. Um, so <laughs> I love that you, you didn't find the book you're looking for, so you wrote the book. <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, but like your story, that's powerful. Yeah. Um, and one, just for you to like share it with all of us is powerful. Yeah. But two things that stand out to me, one is you talked about at kind of the beginning of your story um, that the pastor's wife mm -hmm. listening to you yes. and believing you. Yes. Um, and actually, you shared that with me um, as we've gotten to know each other, the mm -hmm. power. And so listen, if you're in the room tonight and you're like, hey, sexual trauma, not a part of my story, 
um, that you're a part of the story because yeah. it's a part of one of your friend's story. It's huge. And I want you to know the power of listening and believing a friend. Mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. Last night I got home and my daughter, she's in sixth grade. She, she just had a sixth grade day, you know, she hated school. She's like, I don't have any friends. And I went into that room and I wanted to fix her and solve her problem. You ever feel like someone wants to fix you and solve your problem? And it's like, hey, that's not what I need right now, right? And I went in and I heard her and I said, Baylor, I want you to know I hear you and I believe you. And she pulled me in, you know? It's like, that's exactly what she needed. And that's what a lot of you need is you need to be heard and believed. And y'all, we get to offer that to each other. Because we're not a bunch of individuals with our, all of our own kind of mess and brokenness. We're a family that God's brought together for a purpose to shoulder each other's burdens and love each other. So one of the most powerful things you can do is listen and believe. I hear you and I believe you. Yes. And then the other thing that I feel like just stands out from your story, and I want us to get this tonight, is that your story, the story of healing, really points us to the heart of our Father, yes. right? To God. God is a God who wants to heal and redeem and restore. He's a healer. He's a reconciler. He's a redeemer. That's who our God is. Yes. It's what he does. And like, even like thinking through your story, um, and we're going to kind of wrap up here in a few minutes, but even thinking about your story, there wasn't one thing that you did. It was that God brought you on a process, on a journey, journey. Mm-hmm. and he has been healing your heart all along. Yes, he has. And that's what our God does. Yes, he does. Um, something that you say, and I just want everyone to see this, a, a, a quote that I don't know if you made it up or you brought it from somewhere, but it's this, it's the next slide. It's that there is no amount of hurt God's love won't heal. Yep. No amount of hurt. So whatever hurt you feel, whatever level that is, it can't be too much for God's love to heal in you. Yeah. You gotta know that. You gotta believe that. You gotta receive that into your heart and into your soul. So let's go here. Let's just go to the next step because that's what we've, we talked about. Like, what do we want for this night? And it's like, we could inform you. We could, we could give you 10 steps for everyone to go do. But honestly, I think what we want is we want you to know the next step. Yes. And so tonight, if you're in the room and you're like, yes, I'm realizing even more and more the effects of sexual trauma in my life. What's the best next step for me? Can you just kind of walk us through that? The next best step is to acknowledge your story, just to go ahead and face it, and then to talk to someone that you trust, preferably someone who is Mm trauma-informed. And and there are a lot of people here at PC3 who are. Um, So not only um, your, your, not only Clay and and his leadership, but also there's uh, counselors, biblical counselors here at PC3 and staff members that are trauma-informed. And then also Journey to Heal Ministries, we've got several mentors um, that are trauma-informed and willing to talk to you. That is so important, is acknowledging what happened to you, just going in and facing yeah. it, and then um, talking to someone about it and sharing about it. Because sexual trauma, it perpetuates in silence and secrecy, and the hurt of it yep. does, but it's when you bring it out into the light yep. that you can really begin to heal. Yep, we did a series on First John last semester. Yeah. We talked about this idea of we were stepping into the light, and it's when we bring things into light that God can heal them, because yeah. that's where God is. That's it. Like God's in the light, and God wants to expose and not to expose to hurt, but to expose to heal. Mm-hmm. And it's scary. Y'all, honestly, we'd rather stay in the dark a lot, a lot of times, right? We like to hide because we don't have to deal with it or process it because emotional hurt, emotional pain, it's hard. Yes, it is. But God can heal us when we bring it in the light. And that's, that's the case for you as a victim. It's also the case for someone as a perpetrator, right? To, to bring that into light. Maybe tonight you realize... I'm not on the victim side. I'm on the, I did that to someone. Mm. I did something to someone that they did not want, they did not consent to. And maybe you feel conviction. Maybe you feel shame. You gotta bring that into light to let God heal that. Because it's in the light that it says the blood of Jesus purifies us, purifies us, (laughs) heals us. We gotta bring these things into the light. That's the very thing that I would tell any student is first is you gotta tell someone. And I think to your point, which is really (laughs) helpful with this, is you gotta tell someone who is trauma informed at some point. So I think that you can tell a friend, Mm -hmm. you can tell multiple friends, but in the day you've gotta talk to someone who can help walk you through and navigate those deep waters. Um, And for us at Overflow, like I said, this isn't 
infomercial for Journey to Heal, in, in a lot of ways, it has nothing to do with Journey to Heal. It's just that Journey to Heal is here. Like Crystal yeah. goes to our church, y'all. Yeah. And she wrote a book that is so helpful and so practical. And they have people who have walked through this and found healing who are ready to walk with you through it. Yes. And so it's like, man, we've got to get Journey to Heal people in here with you guys for you to know that this exists and that they want to walk alongside yes. of you. And so part of the, the starting point was talking about it yes. and saying, hey, the first step is acknowledging, acknowledging your story and acknowledging your need for help, yes. right? Which is like, yo, that's the, that's the gospel response, yeah. right? Our response to the gospel is to acknowledge our story that we are sinful, that we're broken, we're separated, and to acknowledge that we need a savior. And we just get to do that over and over in our lives as followers of Jesus. Acknowledge our story and acknowledge our need for help. And so um, part of the tonight was starting this, the conversation mm -hmm. Letting you know that you can take that first step, even though it feels scary. But then we want to provide what's the next step and the next step. And we can't do that tonight. So what we want to do is this Thursday, we want to offer what we're just calling an info session for you. Okay, it's just, it's an info session for you, not to find more out about sexual trauma, but to find out the best next steps for you to find hope and healing. Yes. Okay, and so this Thursday night, um, which is in two days, Thursday night at six o'clock down in Treasure Island, uh, we're gonna hold an info session. Crystal will be there, I'll be there, um, mentors will be there, our staff will be there. And it'll be a time for you as a survivor, as a supporter or a friend to come and to learn about these next steps. Very practical things that you can do. Ways that you can get um, into a support community. Yes. You can be connected to a mentor who can walk with you. I'm just telling you, if you would step in and participate in the process, God can do some incredible things in your life. Mm -hmm. And so we wanna make that available to you. And so um, that's the deal. Um, on your way out, you can grab a little uh, handout just to remind you, but we just wanna invite you this Thursday. You don't have to sign up, we were, you know, you just come. We don't know how many of you will come, but we'll be ready for you. Thursday at six in Treasure Island, come and let's learn about some very practical next steps that we can take together. And as I was just thinking about this and kind of where I want to wrap up, we're going to end in a time of prayer. Uh, we're going to end in worship because worship is a weapon. Um, but here's, here's my thought, kind of my final thought is that, y'all, we are whole people, right? Like God made you the, your whole person. He made you to be relational. He made you to be physical. He made you to be spiritual. He also made you as an emotional person. And I think one of the things, maybe the ways that we've, damage some people or hurt people is that what we tell you is if you have emotional pain, emotional baggage, um, just go do more quiet times. <laughs> just be more spiritual and it'll fix your emotional health. And what, we're, what I'm telling you, you do more quiet times, like pursue Jesus and know him and know the Father and know his heart. Mm -hmm. But you got to step in. You got to be willing to open up that emotional side of you and let Jesus into that. Yeah. Let God into that to yeah. search you and to know you to expose things so that you can be healed. We're whole people and God wants to do a whole work in your life. The first step is to open up, to allow God in and to acknowledge your story and acknowledge your need for help. Yes. So before we pray, can we just thank Crystal for sharing her story, for sharing with us, and letting us in. Thank, thank you. you. Overflow, let's spend a time in prayer. If you guys would just close your eyes, bow your heads, uh, I just want to lead us in a, in a couple moments to pray um, and, and not to um, make this moment um, any, or he any heavier than it is, but to maybe just show you what it looks like to be able to hear truth, to receive it, and to step into communion with God, to let him do his work. And so I want to give you a moment just to first moment of prayer is just to for you to talk to God, for you to, in your heart, look up at the Father. And man, whatever you need to say to God, just be honest with him. How are you feeling? What are you thinking? Just take a moment to talk to God. He is not afraid of your raw, real emotions. He's not afraid of your fears. He wants you to bring them to him. So maybe for you, it's you are a victim, or maybe for you, it's you wanna be a supporter. You wanna support and love. Talk to God. Tell him what you're thinking. Tell him how you're feeling. Take a moment just to pray and talk to your father right now.
Now take a moment and I, I want you to pray for the people around you. I want you to pray for the one in four women, the one in three women, the one in four men around you who have experienced sexual trauma, who have been victims and abused. And if you are a victim yourself, I want you to pray for those other people, right? Pain causes us to pull in, but freedom and healing in Christ allows us to look out. So I want you to pray for your brother and sister in the room tonight who has experienced that and who is struggling with the emotions and the hurt. Pray for hope and for healing for them. Pray that they would have confidence to take a first step, to acknowledge their story, to acknowledge their need. Now, let's, let's just pray out of this room. Like God, for God so loved the whole world that he sent his son to suffer and die for us. That doesn't stay in this room. That's way out all around the city, on our campuses, in our friend groups, in our dorms, in our apartments, people who are hurting, who are broken, and they need the healing and the hope that is found in Jesus. Let's just pray that we would be a community of believers who are believing that you're a healing God, who are experiencing healing over time in our community, and who are a light for the world to say, there is hope and there is healing in Jesus. Come and see him. Ask me about my hope. Let's pray for the city out there, for those who are hurting, who need Jesus. And Father God, we just thank you for this night. God, we thank you for Crystal's story. We thank you for her courage to step up and to share, to just be a resource in her life. God, we thank you that you are a healing God, that you're a God who doesn't wait for us to clean up our emotional mess. You went in, you went into that room you went into that closet that we have shut and we have pushed all this stuff in. God, you went in there. You want to do a work there, God. And so we thank you that that's who you are. God, that in Jesus, we have a living hope, not a far away hope, not a dead hope, not a hope one day, but a living hope today. God, I pray that students would find that, that they would find a living hope in the midst of what they have experienced, what they've gone through, whether it's sexual trauma or something else, God, I pray that we find a hope in Jesus. And tonight, God, we want to declare that truth and we want to stand on the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Father God, I pray for healing. I pray for freedom. I pray for hope in this room as we declare Jesus as our living hope. Good man.
Overflow, thanks for leaning in with us tonight. Thanks for listening. Thanks for receiving. I hope that um, you are encouraged. I hope that you know that there is hope for healing. It requires taking a step, and I hope that you have the courage to take those steps that you need and that you have people around you to help support you in that. Um, hey, if you want to talk to or pray with any of those mentors from Journey to Heal, they'll be here. Crystal will be down front. I'll be down front. We'd love to pray with you tonight, talk with you tonight. We also want to invite you to come Thursday at six o'clock in Treasure Island to hear more about the next best step for you in healing. We got it? We're good, Overflow? Hey, listen, let's walk out of here as a family tonight, loving each other, supporting each other, listening and hearing and believing each other and hoping for the best. The best is yet to come in your life because God is there, because Jesus loves you and our God is a healer. We love you guys. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you next Tuesday. We've got a guest speaker coming in. We're gonna celebrate, celebrate baptisms together. It's gonna be awesome. We love y'all and we'll see you next Tuesday. Good night, Overflow. Thank you. <laughs>